This video is brought to you by Ground News. If you live in the UK, it's easy to think that everything is done by Westminster. MPs are the ones who get all the attention. It's the government and the cabinet who get blamed for policy failures. And it's the gossip surrounding the Westminster bubble that generally makes its way onto our TV screens. However, there are other levels of government. And while they might not be as newsworthy, they're just as important. Councils play an important role in the day-to-day -day lives of local people. They're responsible for the delivery of social care to both children and adults, as well as providing so-called neighbourhood services, which includes waste collection, transport, housing and elements of education. Since 2018, we've seen no fewer than 12 Section 114 notices issued, which is effectively declaring bankruptcy, from councils under the control of Labour, the Lib Dems and the Tories. In fact, six of these notices have been issued since 2021. Prior to this, only one council had issued such a notice, all the way back in 2000. Now, when a Section 114 notice is issued, it means that the council is no longer allowed to commit to new spending and must either cut spending, ask the government for capitalisation directions, which basically means to sell off assets or property, or ask the government to reduce the services that they're legally bound to provide. This poses the question then, why are so many councils going bankrupt and what's causing this? Before we start, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell to stay in the loop and be notified when we release new videos. Before getting into which councils have had to issue these Section 114 notices and why, we first need to understand how councils actually get their funding. In essence, there are three main sources of revenue for councils. Council tax, business rates and government grants. Council tax is, to an extent, up to councils themselves to set. Essentially, this is just the amount that households have to pay for their local services. This leads to political parties using the rate of council tax as a selling point, when the tax is low in councils they control, and as an attack line, when they're high in councils their opponents control. Business rates are set by central government and are paid by businesses based on a pence in the pound multiplier, i.e. the more expensive the property is to rent, the more business rates the company pays. And finally, government grants. The responsibility for these grants falls on the Department for Leveling Up, who allocate the funding yearly. The funding is different for different types of councils though, with metropolitan districts receiving the most funding per person, and shire counties and districts receiving the least. Now, the reason behind the difference in funding is nominally because different councils have different needs. Generally, councils with areas of higher deprivation get more funding, although there are some notable outliers. Westminster, for example, received £471 of per-person funding this year, about £200 more than other councils with a similar deprivation level. On the whole, though, councils should get what they need from the government. However, despite this, in the last few years, we've seen a number of councils go effectively bankrupt and issue the dreaded Section 114 notice. So why is this? Well, if you looked at the graph a little earlier, you might have already started piecing together the answer yourself. In essence, over the last decade or so, the real terms funding for councils has dropped. The Institute for Government has pointed out that from 2010 to 2020, central government grants have been cut by 40% in real terms, from £46.5 billion to £28 billion. The government did provide some COVID relief funding for councils in 2020, but even if we factor this in, funding was still cut by 21% by 2021. Now, you might be thinking that if councils got less money from the government, then perhaps they could just increase their revenue by increasing council tax. However, things aren't this simple. Back in 2011, the government introduced the Localism Act, which prevented councils from increasing council tax by more than 2% annually without holding a referendum. It's worth noting that this did increase to 3% in 2018, and that, more recently, governments allowed councils to raise the taxation rate by 5% a year if at least 3% of this was needed to be spent on social care. So, basically, councils have been getting less money from the government and are limited in how much they can increase council tax by. Now, this would be bad enough if council outgoings remained static, but this hasn't been the case. Councils are legally bound to provide social care to their residents. Social care is a broad term that refers to support services provided to those with illness, disability, old age and poverty. 
Since 2015, local councils in England have had to increase their adult social care spending by 14.9%, from £17.9 billion to £20.6 billion. Child social care rose by 18.3%, from £10.3 billion to £12.2 billion. Now, this is a massive difference, especially when you consider that overall government funding was cut in this period. As a result, councils have had to cut other services, with education services being cut by 11.1% since 2015, environmental services being cut by 3.4%, and cultural and related services being cut by 15%. All councils have been feeling the pressure of reduced funding and increased social care costs, and for many of the councils that have gone bust, this has been a contributing factor. However, some councils have faced more specific problems. Birmingham Council, for example, which went effectively bankrupt back in August, suffered due to an equal pay case and a failed changeover of its IT system. Back in 2012, the Supreme Court ruled that the council had breached the Equal Pay Act and as a result had been made to spend more than £1.1 billion over the last decade to settle these claims. The council stated this year that there was still £760 million outstanding on this settlement, and that this, combined with a £100 million failed IT system, led to them declaring effective bankruptcy and issuing a Section 114 notice. Working Council had to issue a Section 114 notice in June 2023 after borrowing millions of pounds for local regeneration projects, such as a 23-storey Hilton Hotel in the town centre, in which the Council even agreed to pay for the hotel's cutlery. The costs skyrocketed, and the Council reached debts of £2.6 billion. But while some councils have clearly made bad decisions, if current trends continue and the demand for social care continues to rise while funding continues to fall, more bankruptcies look inevitable. And this isn't just bad because people go without access to certain council services. It's also bad because, as we mentioned in the intro, some councils will have to sell off their assets, making things even worse in the long term. Without proper funding, though, they may have no choice. Now, the recent news that Nottingham Council issued their Section 114 notice has been covered by 13 news sources. 50% of the reporting is coming from the left and 50% is coming from the right. If you compare the headlines, you'll start to see some interesting framing emerge. On the left, you have one outlet stating that Nottingham City Council declares itself bankrupt. And on the right, you have another highlighting that Labour-run Nottingham City Council declares itself bankrupt as officials slammed for breathtaking waste. This is all possible thanks to our sponsor Ground News, a website and app developed by a former NASA engineer on a mission to give readers an easy, data-driven, objective way to read the news. Every story comes with a quick visual breakdown of the political bias, factuality and ownership of the sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organisations. For example, for the story we mentioned earlier, you can see the bias distribution for every news outlet reporting on it, the complete factuality information and the ownership data. And with their new Bias Insights feature, you can even get a breakdown of the specific differences between left and right reporting. I especially like their My News Bias feature, which allows you to track your reading habits over time. You can view your personal biases, from specific news outlets and political lean to specific topics and locality. I can even see who owns the majority of the news I consume. I know I've personally benefited enormously from ground news. I've gotten much better at spotting political bias, and I've surprisingly challenged some of my own views. I highly encourage all of our viewers to give ground news a try. In fact, we're offering 30% off of their Vantage plan to all viewers. This includes unlimited access to every feature, including to My News Bias. This offer is only available here, so make sure you go to ground.news forward slash TLDR or click the link in the description to get started for under $6 a month.